Hey, everyone. It's great to see you, or I should say for you to see me, and wherever you're tuning in from, on Facebook, YouTube, or our website, we're just glad that you're with us. We hope you're having a wonderful Labor Day weekend, and that it's a chance for us to come together and worship God and open His Word. You know, we just finished a summer-long series called Did God Say That?, where we looked at some phrases that are common, but maybe don't mean what we think they mean. And I've heard from many of you how much it meant to you, how much you learned, and how you appreciated that series. And for what it's worth, those of us who studied and preached, we also learned and grew a great deal through that. And if you've been around Chapel Street for a while, you know that sometimes we preach on topics like this summer. Sometimes we preach on books of the Bible. Um, and you might be wondering, well, why choose that way? Well, sometimes we want to dig into a book of the Bible like we're going to do in this next series. Sometimes we want to look at relevant topics in our culture. But whatever the case, topical or a book of the Bible, it's always the Word of God that's our source and our anchor. And when we preach, it's not our ideas or our opinions. We hope it's coming straight from the Word of God. So let's pray and we'll jump in. Father God, thank you for the opportunity we have to come together, even virtually, and open your word. And we ask now that you'd speak to us through it because we need to hear it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we are starting a new series today called Choosing Joy. And even that phrase is uh, curious. You might think, is joy a choice? Is it something that you can choose? What even is joy, if you think about it? Is it happiness? Is it related to how we think of happiness? In fact, the sermon just last week was on, God just wants me to be happy. Is that what it means? Happiness and positivity? Are Christians supposed to be happy and positive all the time? I know people like that. And sometimes, in fact, I have a friend who says, I don't trust that guy. Nobody's that happy, really. Is that what it is? What about sadness, grief, lament, uh, and sorrow? Are those out of bounds for a Christian? Do we just does being joyful meaning we have to ignore those those emotions? The Christian life is meant to be lived from a place of deep joy, but I think for most of us, and hopefully in this series, we need to realign and re uh, reconstruct what we mean or how we understand what joy actually is. To quote the band Boston. Joy is more than a feeling. There's so much more going on than our emotions and our feelings. Uh, I watched the Netflix show, at least an episode or two, uh, called Tidying Up with Marie Kondo. Perhaps you know about it or you've seen it. It's sort of this Shintoistic uh, journey to minimalism or something, and she, she tells you that you should go into your closet and grab an article of clothing, hold it up and say, does this bring me joy? And if it does, then you keep it. If it doesn't, you throw it away. Well, I don't know. What the, there's something implicit in there if you think about it. That the notion is that our stuff is meant to speak joy into our lives. I don't know. I don't have too many things in my closet. I mean, I like some shirts. I don't know if they speak joy to me. Uh, or that our circumstances are what bring us joy, how we're doing. Um, do you know that 80% of Gen Xers, that's my generation, say that what they need to be have a happy life is more money. But one in four millennials, that's my kid's generation, say that they would give up their job, quit tomorrow, if they could be famous or a social media influencer. So maybe it's not our stuff or our circumstances. Maybe it's our status that's meant to bring us joy. Or how many followers we have, how many people know about us and how we're doing. Is that right? Is it our stuff and our status that bring us joy? Well, if you've ever traveled outside the US or outside the suburbs for that matter, and been around Christians in a different culture, who have far less economically, but they seem to have far more joy, you know that it can't just be our stuff and our status that bring us joy. In fact, my wife and I traveled a number of times, and one trip that we remark on often was to rural Zambia, visiting a church in Zambia there, and these people had literally, comparatively, nothing. And to be with them and to be just the joy of their worship flooding over us with tears to see the, the joy in how much they loved God with all their heart. Now, I don't want to romanticize that. Life in rural Zambia is really hard, and I think many of them would like to have some changes. But something about that experience critiques and challenges our assumptions in the West that it's our stuff and our status that are meant to bring us joy. So our series called Choosing Joy is not just going to look at joy. It's going to look at a specific book of the Bible, actually a letter in the New Testament written uh, by the Apostle Paul called Philippians because he wrote it to people living in the city of Philippi. And the letter is sometimes nicknamed Paul's uh, letter of joy because he mentions jo being joyful and rejoicing so frequently in this letter. Um, now you might be thinking, well, if Paul wrote a letter called the letter of joy or nicknamed the letter of joy, what was going on in Paul's life at the time? If you were to guess how Paul was doing, you might think, well, you know, he's probably, he's probably 
He's trending on Twitter. He's written a bestseller. He's getting great Amazon reviews. He's getting invited to all the great conferences and his, he's just winning at life. Not so. You'd be wrong. Paul, as it turns out, wrote Philippians from prison. Did you hear that? He wrote this letter, one of four letters we call the prison epistles, along with Ephesians and Philemon and Colossians. He wrote it from prison to these people. The letter of joy was written from a jail cell. Now, um, maybe our circumstances don't bring us joy. Maybe it's not our stuff and our status. Maybe it's something more. So I'm going to read just the first two verses of Philippians chapter 1. And we'll jump in and try to understand what Paul's saying. Philippians 1, verse 1, Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, before we jump into these verses, let me give you a little, uh, and the ones that follow it, let me give you a little context for what is happening in this letter and and uh, what's going on in this city called Philippi. You'll see an image here of a map, and you can recognize that Philippi is in Macedonia. So it's not in Asia Minor, in Turkey, which is to the right there. It's in the continent of Europe, which makes it unique. We'll talk about that in a minute. And it was uh, on a road between two port cities. So it was a wealthy city, an influential city. It was a very ancient city by the time Paul got there. It was a Roman colony uh, in 31 BC. Now, for those of you who like history, like I do, let me give you a little history lesson here. In 42 BC, some of you remember this from the Shakespeare's play, Julius Caesar, something unique, special happened in Roman history. Julius Caesar was assassinated by Brutus. Remember et tu, Brute, that guy, and his friend Cassius. Brutus and Cassius become one side of the civil war that breaks out after Julius Caesar's death. The other side is a guy named Mark Antony and his friend Octavian. Those two groups uh, make up this sort of factions of the civil war. And the decisive battle to decide who's going to run and rule Rome happened in the city of Philippi in 42 BC. Um, and so no, in 31 BC. In 42 BC, Julius Caesar is killed. So in 31 BC, there's this battle uh, at, the, at the city of Philippi, and they make it a Roman colony. Now, Mark Antony and Octavian win. Octavian becomes, uh, he names himself or allows himself to be named Caesar Augustus, the August or the Great One. He's the first of five Julio-Claudian Caesars that rule, all of which rule during the time of the New Testament. This is such fascinating stuff. But anyway, back to the, to the church in Philippi. So, when Paul got there, that's the history of the backdrop began. The church began in, a, in an amazing way. You can go and read Acts chapter 16 and read the story of the first people converted to faith in Jesus Christ in Philippi. The apostle Paul was traveling there. He had a vision of a Macedonian man. Philippi is in Macedonia, who said, come and help us. So he traveled to that region and stopped in Philippi. Do you know who the very first person to be converted to faith in Jesus was on the continent of Europe? The very first European follower of Jesus that we have record of in the New Testament is not an influential man, not a political leader or religious leader. It's a woman, a woman named Lydia, a wealthy woman who was a dealer in purple cloth, which meant she had, she had, she had some wealth. And she comes to faith in Jesus Christ through Paul's influence. Do you know who the second follower of Jesus was on the European continent? A slave girl who was being exploited by her masters, her owners. Paul frees her from her uh, bondage and heals her. And these owners are not happy about it. And they have Paul thrown in prison. And the third person converted to faith in Jesus Christ in Philippi was a jailer, Paul's prison guard. While you know the story, or some of you might, Paul and, and Silas are in prison, and Silas starts shaking his chains, at least how that I imagine it, and kind of getting a beat going, chunka, 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 chunka. And Paul's like, hey, I like that groove. So let's keep that going. They start singing a worship hymn at midnight, and there's an earthquake, the chains fall off, the doors fly open, and the jailer thinks they've escaped. It's going to cost you my life. He's going to kill himself. Paul says, don't, don't. We don't want anyone to die. Shares the love of Christ with him. And he's so overwhelmed. He says, you've got to come to my house and share this with my family. And Paul does. So his whole family's converted. That's the start of a church. What an amazing church this must have been. A wealthy woman, a slave girl, and a jailer and his family. Who brings those group people together? Only Jesus. So the, Paul knows these people and he loves them. He knows their story when he writes this letter to them. Okay, so back to Philippians 1 and uh, 1, verses 1 and 2. He says, Paul and Timothy... Timothy was his protege, his understudy, younger brother in the faith. He calls themselves servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, this is amazing. 
Paul, if you know the story, was formerly Saul of Tarsus. He went from persecuting joyful Christians to becoming one, a joyful Christian himself. And Timothy is his younger brother, his protege. He calls himself servants of Jesus, despite his present circumstances, despite the fact that he's in another prison cell right now, likely in Rome, although it could have been in Ephesus. He calls himself a servant of Jesus Christ. This is crucial. He understands his identity, regardless of his circumstances, as belonging to Jesus. I'm his servant. Even though I'm in these chains and in this cell and I'm in this circumstance, I am a servant of Christ, always, no matter where I am. You know, years ago when I visited the Angola prison in Louisiana, I remember uh, talking with one of the inmate pastors. They had pastors and churches functioning inside this prison. One of the pastors says that he believed his purpose was to help these men realize they are not prisoner number whatever. They are children and servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Because their identity was stripped from them and they just identified with a number. He said, God wants to give them their identity back. And I think he wants to do that for all of us. And that's what Paul says here first. Joy comes from knowing who you belong to. I'm a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. Then he says, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. Now, this is really, really important that you understand. Uh, I think it's easy for us to miss. Paul says, to the saints. Saints doesn't mean that you're canonized or you're holier or you're super spiritual. It means you're, you're a believer in Jesus. So you and I, if you believe in Jesus, we are saints according to the Bible to the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. You're in Christ and you're at Philippi. So where's your location? Where's your fundamental primary location? It's not Philippi, it's in Christ Jesus. This is so important for us. Your primary location is in Christ. Regardless of where you live, regardless of where you work, regardless of where you go to school or or where you happen to find yourself, you are located in Christ if you belong to him. Joy flows, friends, out of knowing your identity, I'm a servant of Jesus, and your location, I'm in Christ. I belong to him. Christianity is not about being religious. It's about being in Christ. This is such a huge thing for Paul in all of his letters. Now, we often skip verses 1 and 2, but I hope you're seeing there's so much in here for us. Now, Paul goes on and he, and he writes what is his how he greets. In every one of his letters, he uses the same phrase, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace to you. He says it in every letter. You can go read the New Testament and you'll hear it over and over and over again. It's not just a religious formality, kind of how you say hello. It's something very, very profound. Paul wants to form us, form his, his, his hearers, those who receive the letter, and God wants to form us in the image of Jesus. And he wants the, the primary thing that you think of when you think of God is grace and peace. Is that true for you? When you think about God, is the first thing you think of grace and peace? Maybe you think about sin and judgment. Maybe you think uh, he's going to get me if I step out of line. Maybe you think he's unknowable and far away. A.W. Tozer in a book, The Knowledge of the Holy, said, the most important thing about any of us is what comes into our minds when we think about God. I think Paul is saying, I want you to think grace and peace when you think about God. That's why he writes it in every single letter, because he's telling us that. Now, in the ancient world, in the first century, if you were to write a letter, uh, the, gre- the word for greeting in Greek was the word karen, C-H-A-R-I-N, karen. It just meant greetings. It was the common, customary way to greet. Paul changes one letter, charis, C-H-A-R-I-S. And charis means grace. Grace means, we say, unmerited favor. It means joy, delight, blessing, favor flowing to you, Paul says. Grace also is free. It's unmerited. You can't earn it. I remember years ago, I was with a group of pastors in, uh, down in Georgia. We were speaking at a conference. We went out for a good old-fashioned Southern breakfast. And most of us were from the North. Uh, and one of the guys who's from New York, actually, looked down at his plate and there was a big thing of grits on it and he didn't know what grits were. Uh, maybe some of you don't know what grits are. And he looked at the, way, the server and he said, uh, ma'am, I don't know what this is and I didn't order it. And she said, honey, that's grits. He goes, well, I didn't order that. She goes, Honey, down here, you don't order it and you don't pay for it. You just get it. (laughs) I love that. And I think that's how it is with grace. You don't order it. You don't pay for it. You can't earn it. You just get it. God just gives it if you're in Christ. That's what he wants to do. Peace, then he says. The Hebrew word shalom, the Greek word uh, erene, it means wholeness, fullness, not 
simply the absence of conflict, but the presence of all that makes life flourish even in the midst of conflict. Think about that. Grace, favor, blessing, peace, shalom, wholeness to you. God is always bringing these and sending these to you. These two words characterize what it means to be in Christ. Grace and peace. Yet for many of us, if we're honest, we don't experience grace and peace the way we long to, the way God wants us to. They're just words on a page sometimes. Why not? Why don't we experience and receive grace and peace the way God wants us to, if it's really coming to us? Well, I think two primary reasons. Number one, for some of us, we feel like we don't deserve it. And number two, for others of us, we feel like we don't need it. Both are so wrong. Actually, the truth is you don't deserve it, but that's the point. God gives it anyway because he loves you. And for those of us that are too proud and think we don't need it, that is that is the primary issue that's in our way that God wants to remove. The question is not, is grace and peace coming to you? It is. The question is, are you ready to receive it? I remember years ago, I, I love the Cubs. I love watching Cubs games. And remember when we could go to ball games back when there was fa actual fans, not cardboard cutouts in the stands? And I, I remember walking into Wrigley Field and seeing a little boy with his dad and he had his ball glove. Now we were in the nosebleed section and went up there and he's up there with us underneath the on, overhang behind a pillar. There's no chance of balls coming up there, at least very, very unlikely. And so, some guy said, you know, fat chance catching a ball up here. And the little boy said, you never know, right, dad? And his dad was like, that's right, son. You never know when a ball might come your way. Well, <laughs> I like that image. I brought my glove with anticipation that it might come my way. But in Christ, you do know it is always coming your way. Are you ready to receive it? Are you ready to receive what God wants to give? Because that's what Paul's saying here in these simple words. Okay, we have more to cover. Let's jump in. Let me read verses 3 through 11. I hope you're getting as excited as I am about this letter to Philippians. Paul writes in verses 3 through 11, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless at the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. Wow, Paul could really write. And this prayer is so, so powerful. And there's a lot in, in it for us. Uh, Paul says, I pray with joy. Do you pray with joy? I was thinking about that, just that simple phrase, prayer with joy. Often for many of us, our prayers are with angst, with sorrow, with guilt, with confession. And there's, there's a place for that. But how often are you full of joy when you pray? Just expressing love. It's, it's flowing out of him here. I was convicted by that. I, I'm not sure that I always pray with joy. I pray with a, a long list of needs, a, long, a lot of things I'm concerned about. And that's okay. God invites that. But perhaps one thing I could do and we could do is to learn to pray with joy. Just to express gratitude for who God is and what he's given us. Paul outlines uh, four aspects of joy or sources of joy in this prayer. I want to go through them briefly. The first, the joy of having gospel partners. He says, I thank my God and all my remembrance prayers for you with joy because of your partnership in the gospel. What does that mean? Those of you who've gone into business with a friend, you know that when you're in business together, when you're business partners, it changes the nature of the relationship, sometimes for, for worse. But what it changes is you now have a skin in the game together. You're not just social friends hanging out occasionally. You're doing something together and his good is your good. Her good is your good and your good is her good. It matters now. You, you have a stake in the game together. Something invested, something shared, working toward a common goal. That's what Paul's saying when it comes to the gospel. We have a share in this. We have skin in the game together. We're striving toward the same end, ultimately speaking, with our lives. And then he says, uh, we're partakers of grace. This is the second thing, the joy of being partakers of grace. You're meant to be, uh, you're meant to be the reason for someone else's joy. Do you think about that? God intends for you to bring joy to someone else. And they're meant to be 
a reason for your joy. Just, just for a minute, right where you're sitting, wherever you're watching this, just for a minute, sit where you're seated. Just take a minute. Think of the names and faces that God has given you that bring you joy. Maybe they're sitting right next to you. Maybe they're halfway across the country. Thank God for them. Pray with joy for them. That's, that's what he wants. And do you know that there's people around the world in the, in, the, in the country who might be praying and thanking God for you? That you bring joy to them? That's what God wants. That's be a, to be blessings to those around us. And frankly, think about that. His good is my good. Her good is my good. We live in such a competitive and ri- so much rivalry in our culture. It ought not to be that way. Friends, brothers and sisters, we're in the kingdom of God, we're not in competition with each other. And so much of that goes on. Can you say with all your heart, when someone else succeeds and has blessing, oh, that gives me great joy. Or does a part of you resent it? Does a part of you think, well, why isn't it happening for me? I'm convicted by that when I read this. Uh, most of the time, I, it gives me joy, but sometimes there's a little twinge of competitiveness or of jealousy. And that's not what God wants. You're, Paul says, you're my partners in the gospel and partakers of grace. We share in this thing. It's changed us and we're for it. And it gives me great joy. We are to be kingdom companions, gospel partners, fellow partakers of grace. That, I love that language. What if we saw all of our relationships this way? What if we didn't have, well, these are my Jesus friends. Uh, these are my church friends. Well, oh, these are my drinking buddies. These are the guys I play cards with. Oh, these are the girls that I go you know, out with on the, uh, on the weekends. But what if we said, God, I belong to you and all of my social networks, all of my relationships, what kingdom good, what gospel good could you bring out of these relationships? What if we, I think that's how Paul, Paul saw all of his relationships. By the way, this is why around here we take things like rooted care groups and life groups so seriously, why we talk about them a lot and you'll be hearing more about them, why it matters to us that you're in a community of fellow believers who love you and can walk with you and share life with you and encourage you and bring joy and you can bring joy to them and share sorrows at times, but that too can be a source of joy. So the joy of having gospel partners, the joy of being partakers in grace, And then third, the joy of growing in love. Paul writes in in, uh, in, in verse six, he says, my prayer for you is that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Excuse me, that's verse nine. That your love may abound more and more. How, How can you grow in love if you're not in close relationships? It's impossible. The gospel travels along relational lines and love is only expressed and known and grown in in relational contexts. Well, maybe you think, well, I just want to love God just kind of by myself, you know, stay in my own little space and love God in my mind. That's not real love. That's intellectual pursuit. The love for God is expressed when we love others. This is what Jesus says. The first commandment is love God. The second is actually like it, meaning linked to it. Love others as yourself. Those go together. How can your love abound more and more if you're not in the kind of relationships where self-sacrifice and forgiveness and service are required of you? That's what it means to abound in love. Okay, so the fourth thing. Uh, We skipped over uh, the most famous, uh, well-known verse in this section, which maybe some of you noticed that we read it, but we didn't talk about it yet. Verse 6. And he says, And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. This is the joy of being confident in Christ. This is so crucial. Paul, Paul says, listen, I know you, Lydia. I, know, I remember when you were converted to faith. And I know that the church in, in, in Philippi began to meet in your house. I know you, the slave girl who's unnamed. I know where you were and how much God has done in your life. I know you, Philippian jailer. I know you, people in Philippi. But my confidence is not actually in you. I love you. You bring me joy. And I, and I know you, but I'm not confident in you. I'm confident in the one who's at work in you. And there's all the difference in the world in that. The great joy of Paul is not that these Philippians are so great, because frankly, most of the churches he wrote to had issues. If Paul was going to write a letter to Chapel Street Church, there'd be a lot of issues he would point out. I can think of a few that we have issues. We're not perfect. And his confidence should never be in us, but in the one who saved us, who's sending grace and peace to us and who will continue to do his work in us. He says, I'm sure of this. It's an expression in Greek of absolute confidence. It's a 100% guarantee. I talked with the financial advisor recently about what's the economy going to do? Where should, what should, you know, and he's like, listen, your guess is as good as mine. They all, all the speculators are just that, speculators. 
But the 100% guarantee is that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. That's so, so important. My confidence and my joy are not ultimately tied to who I am or who you are or who we are, but who he is. He's the sure thing. In fact, frankly, if you're, if you're saying, well, Pastor Jeff, am I confident in him? On his own, you shouldn't be. <laughs> Believe me, there's a lot of frailty and insecurity and, and junk. But if it's in the one who saved me and who has redeemed me and who leads me, it's a sure thing. The same thing for you. Doesn't mean we don't screw up. It means what Paul is saying, I am confident, despite the fact that I'm in prison and you have your issues, that Jesus is not done with you. That he is not, the work is not finished. And by the way, it's a completion he says, he'll carry it on to completion. It's not just going to end. I hate the, these postmodern movies that just end. Nothing's resolved. They just, they think, well, what happened? Where did, did they, and, and you don't know. Some people love those. I, I drive me nuts, you know? The gospel story is not that this, this life just ends and that's it. No resolution. There's a completion coming in your life, in my life, and in the whole world. He'll carry it on to completion. He started it. He'll finish it. We can trust him with that. And that should give you joy. That should give you deep and abiding joy, even in the midst of pain. Because everything's different when you know the end of the story. That's what Paul's saying. I'm confident that the one who saved you so long ago is still at work and will never stop working until the day of completion. Yes, I'm in a jail cell. Yes, I've had to suffer hardships along the way. Yes, you have your issues. Yes, I know that you're persecuted for your faith. Yes, I know that the Roman Caesars are not exactly friends to Christ. Yes, I know all that. But I know how the story ends, and so do you. And that should give you joy. The gospel means, friends, it's not all one day going to just end. It's all one day going to be completed in Christ. But we've only looked at 11 verses and just at the surface, but can you see what Paul's saying here? Joy is a choice we make. It's a choice to know our identity, servants of Christ, to know our location in Christ, to recognize that we have partners in the gospel, partakers of grace. We grow in love for each other and our confidence is rooted in who Jesus is. There's so much more to come. It's only four chapters, but friends, it's gold. I hope you'll join us for this series and dig in and read and pray your way through with us. We're gonna close this service by coming to the Lord's table. The table of the Lord, bread and cup, is meant to be a place of that confidence and assurance again for all God's people. Whether you're part of Chapel Street or not, it doesn't matter if you're tuning in and you know Jesus, you're in Christ, then you're welcome at his table. And I just wanna encourage you to a minute, to take a minute to pray, to confess, to prepare your heart, get the elements ready because we're gonna come to his table and we're gonna celebrate the assurance we have, the confidence we have in Jesus. Well, you're sitting around your table, I'm sitting around this table, but together we're coming to the table of the Lord. And again, it doesn't matter if you're part of this church, if you belong to Jesus Christ, you're welcome at his table. We're going to do now, through the simple elements of bread and cup, what Christians have done down through the centuries as a way of remembering his sacrifice and receiving again the assurance of his grace. When Paul said he's confident of this, we can be confident because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that on the night that he was betrayed, Jesus took bread and he broke it and he passed it to his disciples and he said, this is my body, it's given for you. Take the bread in your hands now, pass it among those who are with you and together let's eat this and remember him. New Testament says that after they had finished eating together, Jesus poured out a cup. He said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for the forgiveness of your sins. And that every time we, his followers, eat the bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the truth of his death and resurrection until he returns. So take the cup that you have, pour it out, pass it among yourselves, and let's proclaim the truth and grace of the resurrection of Jesus together. Amen.